thank you very much. Thank you. I'm excited to be here in York County. Uh, see lots of friends, I think, uh, since I worked with a lot of people from York County. And my husband taught in York County at, at uh, York High, at uh, Queens Lake, and at TAB. Intermediate, I think. So uh, we've got lots of connections to uh, York County. I used to go to the musicals up at York High School, enjoyed them tremendously. So I am uh, happy to be here today, and um, I thought I would talk a little bit about my connection with the people in the movie first, uh, and why I wasn't in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> I've even had people ask me which, which, which one of the movie stars played me in the movie. I said, well, none of them. <laughs> so, um, and then um, a few lessons. When we talk to students, we often talk about some of the lessons that were in the movie. And then uh, we, um, I'll talk a little bit about my career, uh, since it was slightly different. Uh, and uh, my journey to NASA, I'm from North Carolina, a small town right outside Charlotte, uh, and um, how I got to NASA. And I worked as a human computer for a while. That's why I made the book. But then I did switch to engineer. and worked about 25 years in research there and then in, moved into management. So, um, so uh, Katherine Johnson and Dorothy Vaughn and Mary Jackson were all still at NASA when I went there. And um, I will say Dorothy Vaughn lived very near me down the street. Katherine Johnson and I were in the same church for the last 50 years. Uh, so I knew the two of them, especially Catherine, uh, better than I did them all. But uh, Dorothy Vaughn, of course, when I got there, was had a. I was told by my friend here that that, that uh, they were next door to each other, working in the computational facility. But she was. She had an office near the front of ACD, and people all over the field who wanted to learn to write Fortran programs would go and get and consult with Dorothy Vaughn. She would help them get those programs to run and everything. So uh, I certainly saw her every time I walked over to ACD with a computer program to set, leave it off to be run there. Uh, and um, Catherine and Mary, they, we had a technical organization out at Langley of black technical professionals that uh, were in the National Technical Association, and we would do programs to help the youth in Hampton, and mostly Hampton, but we'd run SAT tutorials. We would have math contests uh, to, that we would give to middle and early high school students to kind of uh, let them assess where they were and realize that they didn't dislike math and that you know math could be fun and they could do well in it and things like that. And then one of the main programs was with college students. We would bring in college students from North Carolina, uh, places in Virginia, Washington, D.C., and Maryland, and students that um, had had summer internships, would, uh, we would send out a proposal for papers, for talks, and have those students come in and give talks on the research that they did. And they would be judged on how well they did, gave a presentation, and they would win uh, monetary prizes for winning those uh, presentations. And I will tell you, I think that, that that was an excellent program because I never had the experience of giving a technical presentation or a technical talk until I was in graduate school. So uh, I worked very closely with Katherine Johnson and Mary Jackson in the National Technical Association. Uh, and I got to know them because none of us worked together. Uh, NASA's a pretty big place, and I'm sure there are a lot of people here who probably worked there. Uh, it was a pretty big place, and you got to know the people who were working in your area, particular area, or in your building. But there were lots of buildings and offices out there that you didn't know anybody. And um, so, so that's, that's sort of the way it was. Those um, three ladies, Dorothy, of course, came there in 1943. And I, I, I think if you've read the books, how many of you have read the book? A few? Yeah, uh, I think, you know, I've heard people say that there was a huge picture 
of, of a lot of people standing in a hangar out there, and you, there were black faces of women standing in that picture. And folks said, well, what were black women doing here, you know, in those times? What, you know, why were they there? And white women, too. And it turns out that it goes back to the beginning of uh, NACA. That, uh, of course, the Wright brothers inv invented the planes here. And uh, World War I came along. That, well, the Wright brothers wanted their planes really to be used for recreation more so than for war. But the English and the French and the Germans went, uh, took those airplanes and really developed them for World War I. And they went a long way. So they ended up being sort of ahead of the United States in airplanes. And uh, some people went to the president, Woodrow Wilson, I think it was, in 1915, and said, hey, wait a minute. We need to do some, some, some kind of coordination in this country for the development of the airplane. The rest of the world is surpassing us with, with the uh, information on airplanes. And so Woodrow Wilson established the committee called the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics. It uh, wasn't, and the title, it was just a big committee, so it didn't fall, fall under the rules of the agencies and things like that. That committee chose Hampton to establish its first laboratory. So they came down and they built the, uh, the Langley NACA uh, laboratory in Hampton, and they built wind tunnels and, and everything. Uh, there and started doing tests. They were testing all sorts of wings. They were testing airfoils. They were uh, testing engines and everything. And well, this was generating a lot of data. And the engineers that were there, the male engineers that were there, started complaining about all these calculations they had to do. And uh, hey, this is too much for us. And they were doing it on slide rolls. Uh, and so they complained and everything. And so around 1935, um, they decided, well, you know, we can, we can hire some women who were math majors in college to come in and help with these calculations. So they mainly looked, I guess, in North Carolina and Virginia. But they started hiring white computers in 1935 to come out there and work on these calculations to reduce the data, to help get the reports out that they could send to the military and to the airplane companies that had been established in the United States. Uh, and then. Um, they were still, of course, generating all this data, and they still needed some more folks. Well, when World War II was coming along, uh, J. Philip Ran a. Philip Randolph, a labor union leader, went to President Roosevelt and said, well, uh, I think you should issue an executive order that uh, for any defense company in this country, there would be no discrimination in who was hired, that you could hire blacks and whites. So this opened the door for NACA to hire black females. And so the first class of black females was hired in 1943. And Dorothy Vaughn, I think it was five of them or something, Dorothy Vaughn was in that class. So she came in 1943. Uh, Mary Jackson came in 1951, I believe, and Katherine Johnson came in 1953. So they were from 25 to 15 years ahead of me. I was hired in 1967. And uh, so when Hollywood called um, Shetterly, uh, I mean, I've never seen anything work. She, she got the book contract, and it's, I think three weeks later, Hollywood called and said, we want to make a movie. And I mean, it, I've never seen anything work so rapidly in my life. So, so that's how things move so rapidly there uh, to get the, the movie and everything done. But they said, well, we won't, I, I guess the, the script, I will tell you that the script and the book were written at the same time because Margot had submitted a 60 page uh, proposal for the book and that's what was accepted. And when they called so quickly about the movie, Margot hadn't written the book yet, and so they were ready to write the script. So they both worked from the script. And the script writer would say, you know, it, the movie has to be pretty tight. And the movie, a script writer knows what people like in a movie and kinds of things that should go in a movie to make them go see it. 
and things like that because Margot would say, she would send her a draft of her script and she'd say, uh, oh no, it didn't happen like that, it didn't happen like that. And she said, well, let me tell you something about a script. You got to do so and so and so and so if you want people to come and see this movie and so forth and so on. And so Margot said she learned a lot about scripts and working with the script writer as she was doing the, the, um, the, the uh, book and everything. So they chose, what, two years, or was 61, 62 or something, is the time period of that movie. And they, they were sort of free with the time, too, because in 61, 62, they did not have the segregated computers on the base because Sputnik went up in October of 57, and I was a senior in high school then. Well, they took NACA and used it to, to start NASA which became a governmental agency. They could not have the segregated groups in this governmental agency, so the, so the West computers went away when, when it became NASA. And so that was one, you know, that was one slip in time, because they were showing you segregated groups in 1961, but that was not true. They had kind of slipped the time in there. Um, I also asked Katherine Johnson if she ever ran through the rain to go to the bathroom. She said no. <laughs> so so that, that too was kind of a slip. But um, some of the lessons that, that uh, I usually talk with students about in the movie uh, is all three of those ladies kind of spoke up for what they wanted. And, and I'm telling students that's an important thing for you to learn to do. Say what it is you want. Uh, Dorothy Vaughn said she wanted, well, she said she wanted to be a supervisor. Her supervisor says, oh, the work is getting done. She says, yeah, the work is getting done because I'm doing it. You know, after, she, because she had had a white supervisor at first and she left for some reason and Dorothy was acting, I guess for, especially in the movie, she was acting. Uh, but she, she let them know that she wanted to be the supervisor and more than once. Uh, Mary Jackson wanted to be an engineer. And uh, she actually had a sponsor who helped tell her, you know, well, you need to speak up, you need to apply for this, you need to do so forth. And she did, and she became the first black e uh, female engineer out there. Dorothy Vaughn was the first black supervisor out there. And Katherine Johnson, um, when she first came there, the way the, the way the West computers worked is engineers could bring work into them to do the work. Uh, or they might ask to borrow somebody out of that pool and they would actually go and sit with the group. Uh, and I think Ka Catherine, pretty, sh pretty soon after she got there, went to work in a, in a flight, flight dynamics or some area. Uh, and they liked her and she pretty much stayed there uh, and, and did not go back to the West computers very often. But... Um, of course, and you, you saw her being uh, exposed to discrimination in, uh, of the people that were there in the room. Uh, and ex except once or twice in the movie, they, they did their jobs. They didn't say, well, I can't do my work because people are treating me like so forth and so on. So even though they faced discrimination, and, and all of them did, they did their jobs well. Uh, I would say, I was cast as standing on their shoulders because I think if they had not done their jobs well, that they would not have still been hiring black females. And, uh, and so I, I was hired, as I said, in 1957. Uh, what's another lesson? When Dorothy Vaughn walked, walked, uh, was on her way to her supervisor's office and walked by this big empty room, she, uh, she asked her supervisor, well, what's going in that room over there? And she says, oh, uh, it's, what is it? It's uh, IBM. Uh, that, that's supposed to calculate a lot faster than you ladies do. She, Dorothy says, yeah, I guess that's good for NASA. But what was she thinking? That's not so good for us. And so the next scene you saw was Dorothy Vaughn in a library looking for a Fortran programming book, which, uh, added some humor because she ended up taking the book, I guess. And she says she paid taxes, so she didn't really take it. <laughs> so <laughs> so, uh, so that she, was, she, was, she knew what was going on around her. 
And she, when she went back to her office, not only did she, in the movie, she got the whole computer running. I think she beat the man from IBM getting it up and running. But she, um, she taught all the ladies in her office how to program. She learned how to program, and she taught everybody in that office how to program. And that sort of led to that scene with them marching from the West computer office over to the computer office, which I think was a pretty, it was in all the trailers early on. That was a great scene. Uh, so uh, let me see. And I thought that when Mary Jackson went to the judge to, to give her case for why she should be able to go to Hampton High School to take the courses that were required for her to become, start working as an engineer, I thought she did a smart argument. She, she had done her homework. She knew about that judge. She knew he was the first in his family, you know, to go to college or to become a judge. And, you know, well, which is going to make you feel better if you... Um, turn me down or if you were the first judge to allow a black female to go to Hampton High School. And he kind of thought about that and he says, well, you know, I guess my name would get out there more if I'm the first judge to do this. <laughs> and uh, so she gave, she did her homework in that argument. And um, so those were some of the lessons that we often talk with the students about that, that you've always got to do your work and do it well. That's the bottom line. But uh, and if people aren't treating you right well, you know, you do your work and then you try to work out the treatment there, but make sure that your work gets done. So um, those were some of the lessons uh, that were learned there. And um, I came in in 67, two years before we walked on the moon. But, and I was assigned to the computer office in the reentry physics branch which uh, was the branch that would have calculated how space vehicles come back into the atmosphere, uh, what speed they're going to come in, uh, how hot the vehicle is going to get, can that vehicle withstand that, those temperatures, the angle that it comes into the atmosphere so it doesn't bounce back out and go back out into space. <laughs> they had already done the calculations for the Apollo program by the time I got there, since the, they were landing on the moon two years later. In fact, the, the Apollo 1 accident down at the Cape was the same year that I came there. So they had already done those calculations. So let me, um, and you can stop me if any of you have any questions too. Let me tell you a little bit about my uh, background. I, uh, I'm, like I said, I'm from Monroe, a uh, small town. They didn't offer a lot of higher math where I came from, and, he, and I left my hometown and went to a boarding school my last two years of uh, high school, but they didn't have a lot of math either. So I ended up, my highest level of math uh, in high school was plain geometry. They didn't teach anything above that. I had algebra and plain geometry. And, uh, but when I took plain geometry, I fell in love with math. I had really even thought about trying to um, go into biological sciences and everything, but I found out that I really loved the physical sciences and the math so much more. So I came up here to Hampton Institute to school, and I'm saying I'm going to major in mathematics. Well, all the people from Hampton and Norfolk and Washington and New York, those kids had had calculus and everything in high school. So I said, well, I'll just start with 101, but I'll still say math. But then my father wrote me and said, Christine, in 1958, I don't think there are that many jobs out here in mathematics for a black female. He didn't know about the West computers and things at Langley. But, and so he says, I think you need to get a teacher certificate. So, and, uh, so he was looking out for me, and I'm saying, uh, gosh, how, how am I going to do this? I don't know when this, this formula kind of gelled in my mind, but I was kind of guided by something called P to the fourth power, which uh, the first P was perceive of the job you want to do. And I had perceived of being a mathematician. Uh, this is what I wanted to do. And then the second P was plan what you have to do to get there. And so I knew that I had to take a lot of mathematics and everything to, to get to be a mathematician uh, since I was kind of at the bottom. Third P was prepare. That's work the plan. Prepare, pre take, take all those classes you had to take. And the fourth P was persist. 
you're going to run into some roadblocks and everything. And so the students seem to kind of like that formula, so they all write it down when I say it. Uh, now I uh, actually think that I also need to add a fifth P, and that fifth P I kind of called project. If you think you've got the, the, the uh, career that you think you want, I think you need to make sure that that career is going to exist in 10 years or 20 years. Uh, in other words, don't, don't uh, say I'm going to be a welder if the robots are going to eliminate all the welding jobs or something like that. So make sure that your job has a future. Uh, computers seem to be one of the futures now. Uh, everything, everything's being run by computers. But So that would be a fifth P in the, in the little formula. So as I was thinking about that, uh, I said, well, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to kind of do both. I'm, I'm going to get on the track for both. So I had to take 30 hours of education to, to become a teacher and you know, so, some math classes. And I was a physics minor and some physics classes. But I said, uh, somehow I'm going to work these higher math classes in that were not required for me to graduate. So my senior year, I did my student teaching uh, there in Hampton in um, geometry and solid geometry and physics. But I also, my senior year, took four math classes each semester in the higher math classes that I was not required to have. So when I graduated that year, I had 24 hours of higher level math that was not required for me to, to graduate from college. So I, uh, oh, that's you. Yeah. <laughs> so I, um, I, I went to teach. I went to teach in Brunswick County, in Lawrenceville, Virginia. And the teachers there uh, said to me, hey, you know, we drive up to Virginia State College on Saturdays to take in-service classes. Would you like to go? I said, yeah, that, that's great. So I started riding with them up to Petersburg, and I enrolled in a math class. The head of the math department taught the class. Uh, and um, you know, I enjoyed it, went through that, went through that year, taking two classes. Um, about two or three years later, I ended up getting married and everything, and I taught in Portsmouth for a year. Well, I taught, I suggested in Portsmouth, I says, well, you know, Virginia State has in-service classes. Uh, do you all want to ride up there? And this time it was Friday nights. Uh, and so the first semester, uh, had a carload of people going to Virginia State to take classes. Second semester, everybody quit but me. Oh. <laughs> So I'm, a, uh, so I'm going up there on Friday nights by myself, yeah, and ho hanging my head out the window or chewing gum or something to stay awake coming home sometimes. But um, my husband got, a, he had gone to Virginia State to school. He got a fellowship to go up there the next year to work on a uh, master's in biology. And so I'm saying, well, I need to find a job in Petersburg. So um, I went. The next, next time I went to class on Friday night, I went up to the teacher, head of the math department, and I said, well, I just wanted to ask you if you knew of any jobs available around here. Uh, I, um, we're going to be moving here, and I'm looking for a job. He says, oh, you're looking for a job. I said, yeah. He says, well, let me take you across the hall to Dr. Hawkins, in the physics, head of the physics department. He's looking for a research assistant in aerosol physics. So we went across the hall and met Dr. Hawkinson. And before I went home that night, I had this research assistantship in aerosol physics, and, which I wouldn't have gotten if I had not taken all these extra math classes. Uh, that would pay for me to get a master's degree. It was going to pay some cash to me. Uh, and uh, like I said, I would, I would get my own master's degree. So that it worked out well. So I did my little research, uh, my master's thesis on light scattering of non-spherical particles. Don't know why I never worked in atmospheric sciences. But uh, anyway, when I graduated, I went by the placement office. And the uh, young lady there says, well, where have you been? NASA was here recruiting yesterday. I said, oh, I didn't know anything about it. She says, well, I tell you what, here, you fill this application out and bring it back to me, and I'll mail it in. She did that, and about three, three or four weeks later, I had an offer from NASA to, to go to NASA. So, uh, and that's when I went into the reentry physics group. Uh, there, the engineers would bring equations to, to the 
into the office and ask you to solve them. I could program because I learned to program in graduate school. And by the way, I got my graduate degree in applied mathematics, so which was kind of halfway between the physics and the math, uh, but still in the right direction. So uh, after I'd been there for a few years, Sometimes the engineers would explain what the equations were, were doing. Sometimes they wouldn't. I realized that I liked understanding the relationship between the math e equation and the physical world and what the, what the answers to these equations meant in the physical world. And uh, so after I worked in the computer office for a few years, I realized that the equations that the engineers were bringing in were uh, very similar to the equations I had worked when I was in graduate school. So then I says, well, that's what I want to be doing. I want to be working on my own projects over there. So I asked an immediate supervisor about moving over, and they said, no, no chance, no chance you can do that. And uh, a few months later, I went to another higher up supervisor and said, well, I'd just like to ask you one question. Why is it that the females and the males coming in here with similar backgrounds get a, uh, assigned to such different jobs? The, the women are put in the computer pool where they don't write their own papers, they don't give talks, and they don't get promoted very much. The men are put in an engineering section and given their own, job, own cast to work on. They give talks, they write papers, they get promoted. He said, nobody ever asked that question before. <laughs> I, I said, well, I'm asking it now. And with about, in about th I left shortly after our conversation. And about three weeks later, I got promoted and I got transferred to an engineering section. Well, this was about 1971 or 72. The United States had just canceled its SST program because of the sonic boom. And uh, so NASA decided they needed to up their work on trying to see if they could reduce the sonic boom. People still like to go fast. They still uh, wanted to, um, you know, get places faster. And so I, uh, and I uh, was assigned to work on sonic boom minimization. Everybody know what a sonic boom is here? Yeah, when I talk to, it's, it's of course a company is an airplane when it is flying faster than the speed of sound. And the speed of sound here at sea level is about 750 miles an hour. So uh, I was my, my boss, uh, first assignment, he brought a technical paper in uh, written by a couple of Cornell University professors on sonic boom minimization. Here I want you to develop a computer program that uh, turns this you know, into a way that we can try some different designs. And so um, when I'm talking to students about what a sonic boom is, I, talk, I use a balloon as an illustration. I say, um, you have a certain pressure, air pressure on your ear. And if I were to blow up a balloon, I am putting more pressure into the balloon. And uh, so the balloon pressure is higher than the pressure on your ear. If I stick a pin in the balloon, there is a shock wave set up going out in all directions at the speed of sound. And when that shock wave hits your ear, the pressure on your ear jumps from the pressure it was at first to the pressure that was in the balloon. And that's the pop you hear in a balloon. So when an airplane is flying faster than the speed of sound, uh, you get this cone from the beginning of the airplane uh, that looks like this. If your airplane is at 50,000 feet in the air, that cone extends all the way to the ground. And where it intersects the ground is this dark area. So it is, it is moving molecules out of the way. It is generating shocks off the airplane in here. The pressure inside this cone is higher than the pressure outside that cone. So if I was standing here on the ground, and this airplane is moving at Mach 1 or 2, that's the, 1 times the speed of sound or 2 times the speed of sound, I don't hear anything right here. But when this dark area comes over me, this, I'm in the high pressure area. 
and you hear the sonic boom. And when you look up, you don't see anything, do you? You have to look down there the way the airplane is flying because in that time, uh, for this thing to go all the way to the ground, the airplane has moved a long way in this direction. So you have to look over there to see the airplane that generated the sonic boom. And uh, so that's kind of the, the theory behind how the sonic boom is generated. It can be very loud. The, I do know that uh, we had put some computers in people's houses around Hampton and York County where sonic booms were generated as part of our research program and you had to give your feedback on how disturbing they were to you. Uh, I, will, I, I didn't tell you one important point. As the United States was getting ready to build the SST in the late 60s, uh, the English and the French were going to build one and the Russians were going to build one. Uh, as a part of the United States program, they did flight tests in, over Chicago and over Oklahoma City. They got military supersonic airplanes and flew them over both cities, and they had banks of telephones with people answering the complaints of the people that were hearing the sonic booms. And so the United States canceled their SST program. The English and the French, of course, went on to build the Concorde, and the Russians went on to build the TU-144. So uh, when the United States canceled its program, they also passed a law that said there could be no commercial supersonic flight over the continental United States. And that's where we sit today. So you might see some military airplanes flying supersonically, but you don't see commercial airplanes flying supersonically. So, um, so anyway, that's, that's kind of, this was my assignment to work on this. Was that the, okay. So uh, what the computer program that I built did was it worked off of the equivalent area distribution of the airplane. That is, you, if you had the airplane in my hand sitting here, if you sliced it like a lemon and calculated the area due to volume at each, at each point along the axis, that gives you your equivalent area due to volume. Then there's another equivalent area on the airplane, and that's due to the air that is flying over the wing and under the wing. The wings of an airplane are generally rounded on the top. It means the air flows faster over the top of the wing. It's slower here. The pressure here is higher. So you got a higher pressure under the wing and a lower pressure over the wing. So your resultant force would be which way? Up. And that's called the lift. That's what holds the airplane up. And so the second equivalent area we would calculate along the axis of the airplane would be the equivalent area due to lift. Where, how much lift are you getting here? Well, most of it's going to be over the wings and everything. And so you calculate that. You add those two equivalent areas together, and you get the equivalent area of the total airplane. That would be the output of this program that I wrote. And the, it was the output of the equivalent area, which is supposed to produce the minimum sonic boom. So it, uh, I thought I had a sample in here, but it was at the minimizing equivalent area actually was pretty pretty smooth line that reached its peak over here at the end of the airplane. Most airplanes that fly around today have an equivalent area that comes up and there's a peak and then it comes back down. So that would be the difference in what we had in the airplanes flying around and what you wanted. And so we, we printed out, we would choose the Mach number, the speed, the altitude, the weight, and the length of the airplane, and it would give us the equivalent area. And then we would sit down and design an airplane. And here's one of the first designs, and this is just a wing and fuselage. This one was designed for Mach 2. Uh, and we're sitting in our supersonic tunnel out there at Langley. Uh, it's several, I, I don't, about eight inches long or something. So we built, uh, we designed several airplanes with different Mach numbers. Uh, here's another one that's actually got some engines on it and everything. We would test these in our wind tunnels. And then uh, this is the wind tunnel. Here's the airplane in the wind tunnel at Langley. This is a pressure probe. This pressure probe, this, this, will, this uh, uh, thing here would actually move forward a little bit to move the airplane forward, such that that, that cone off the airplane that we saw 
is actually falling over this pressure probe here. So it would be measuring the pressure inside that cone. There is another pressure probe up, up there that you can hardly see that would be measuring the pressure outside that cone. And it is the difference in those two pressures that you hear, uh, just like on your ear with a balloon. So we, we went through years of uh, building airplanes and, and testing them. We were working with people like Boeing Aircraft, McDonnell Douglas, Lockheed Martin, the airplane companies. They were doing some of their own designs and everything. And we said, you know, this looks like it works. You know, we, could, we would get a smaller shock from these, uh, from these designs and a shock that was kind of flat going across the top. And we said, this looks like it works. So. Um, so we, we were kind of satisfied. Boeing says, hey, you can't stop in just the wind tunnel. You need to do a flight test. And so uh, we're, we're up about 1990, uh, the late 90s now. And I had actually kind of moved away, moved on into something else. But they borrowed two F-5s from the Air Force. And uh, this is one of the F-5s in which they have added extra panels on this airplane so that the equivalent area of this airplane matches the equivalent area that came out of that computer program. So this is supposed to be the low boom demonstrator. And here is a picture of the shocks. A uh, regular airplane would give you a bigger shock here that you would hear. This low boom plane has the smaller shock. It's kind of flat. And so it sounds a lot more muffled when you hear it. And uh, we went out to the Mojave Desert in California, and we tested these airplanes. This is the F-5 that has no modifications to it. This is the one you just looked at, the one that's got the low boom shape. And this is an F-15, which is measuring the shocks off of these airplanes. And they would measure the shocks all the way to the ground. And uh, the day that they did this test, I was in Colorado, and one of my friends who was in the in the control room out in California called me. You could hear the engineers in the room shouting, just like when John Glenn came back from his orbit, because it was a successful flight. So uh, the one thing that is uh, that I'm kind of excited about and hopeful about is that NASA is supposed to issue a contract this year to build a low boom supersonic X plane, which is a continuation of this work. This is uh, one of the designs uh, of a low boom uh, test plane. And the difference is, I told you, we just, that other plane that I showed you that looked like a porpoise was uh, showing you the sonic boom plane, but it wasn't a very good supersonic airplane. You need a certain design for it to be an efficient supersonic airplane. So this would be the design where you've integrated the sonic boom requirements and the supersonic requirements in one airplane. And they are supposed to build this um, if, well, within the next three years. And they think it would be flying by 2021 or 2022. This is a model that they were actually testing out at the Langley Low Speed Tunnel uh, when they had open house this summer. And uh, they were looking at the low speed handling qualities of the airplane in the low speed tunnel. Uh, so I, I read, I have to read this in Aviation Week like you all do. <laughs> But uh, so they're supposed to they're supposed to let that contract uh, sometime in 2018 and they will, of course, check out the supersonics of the airplane. But then they will fly that airplane over people like you in this room. <laughs> and then they will get your feedback on could you could you stand to hear this noise with airplanes flying over you making this noise every day. And uh, if they if uh, they will take this data and go to the FAA and ask for a rule change, which where they would say there can be supersonic commercial flight over the United States. And then you could fly from here to California in two and a half hours instead of five hours. So that's the whole purpose of the program. And, uh, that, and so I'm kind of excited. I hope that that will work, and I hope everything works out all right. And that's kind of my, that was my career uh, in the research out there.